<laughs> so welcome everyone to the Lead for Pollinators Creating Pollinator Habitat webinar series. I am Michelle Colopy, Executive Director of Lead for Pollinators. Our webinars are supported by the following sponsors. Hispanic Marketing and Public Relations. Visit hispanicmpr.com for interviews, presentations, and more. Beauty Beyond Belief Seeds specializes in wildflower seeds, heirloom vegetable seeds, grass seeds, regional wildflower seeds, and special use wildflower mixes for Western US planting zones, including their line of four great pollinator mixes. Shop for your garden and pollinator habitat at bbbseed.com. Two Million Blossoms Magazine will awaken readers to the vast diversity of pollinating insects and animals. This quarterly magazine explores how bees, birds, butterflies, and bats enhance our planet. Subscribe today using the discount code word LEAD and receive $5 off the subscription rate for one year. Visit 2millionblossoms.com. OPN Seed has partnered with Lead for Pollinators with pollinator mixes created for beekeepers and anyone who wants to attract and support pollinators. You can get native seeds for Eastern US planting zones at OPN Seed. Go to the Lead for Pollinators website donor affiliations page and select Support Our Cause to view featured seed selections and a portion of sales generated from our website will help support our work. Live webinar presentations are recorded and can be viewed through our partner at Dove Audiovisual. You can view these topics through our pay-per-view access. Visit our website for the recorded login to learn webinars and select a topic at your convenience. Our speaker today is Shannon Trimpoli. Shannon is a beekeeper, wildlife biologist, author, and public speaker who lives in Kentucky. Her goal is to help people connect with the nature around them. She is the host of Backyard Ecology, a weekly blog and podcast focused on igniting our curiosity and natural wonder, exploring our yards and communities, and improving our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Shannon also owns and operates Busy Bee Nursery and Consulting, which specializes in plants and habitat consulting services for honeybees, native pollinators, and wildlife conservation. Her first book, Plants Honeybees Use in the Ohio and Tennessee Valleys, was published in 2018. When we think about plants for bees and other pollinators, flowers are often the first thing that comes to our minds. However, trees, especially in the eastern U.S., can be extremely important sources of nectar and pollen. In this talk, we'll discuss the overall importance of trees and shrubs for bees, including some specific examples and when they bloom in the eastern U.S. Please welcome Shannon Tromboli. Hi, everyone. Um, give me just a second, I'll share my screen. Not what I meant to do. <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. Thank you guys so much for spending your evening with me. Um, I know we've all got a million different things going on and that we could be doing, so I am always appreciative to anyone and everyone when they decide to spend a little bit of time with me and listen to me talk about all these wonderful things that well, we all love to learn about and um, talk about. So we're gonna jump pretty much right into here because I've got lots and lots of things to talk about. Um, I can literally go on forever about this subject, but I wanna try and keep it to an hour to be respectful to all of you all and all of your time. I'm gonna say a few quick things though about this presentation. First of all, I am taking a very liberal definition with the term trees, which means I'm also going to include those shrubs and bushes as well. And this presentation is going to be very focused on the Eastern US because, well, that's where I live. So that's what I'm most familiar with. But 
the concepts that we talk about at the beginning are really going to be universal pretty much. They're going to apply everywhere. The plants that we talk about later on towards the end, those are going to be very much the Eastern US portion of it. So let me do this real quick. Okay. So with that, we're gonna jump straight into here. And I want to make this interactive because if you're like me, we've sat through way too many Zoom presentations by this point. And it gets boring to listen to somebody go blah, 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 blah. It gets boring for me to go blah, 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 blah for an hour. So let's talk a little bit. In the chat, I want you to tell me, what is the first image that pops into your mind when I say B? And I will wait. So don't, don't, don't try and nobody <laughs> put, put stuff in there. I will wait for you. I love this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Telling me. <laughs> okay, Tara, you have to be different. That's great. <laughs> so I love this. Bumblebees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, then honeybees. Honeybee, spelling bee, sewing bee. There's so much diversity here. We're going to skip the spelling bee and sewing bee. We're going to stick to the bee critters on this presentation. But I love it that there is so much diversity here. And that's really awesome, too, because most people, when I say bee, the first thing that pops into their mind is a honeybee. That's kind of everybody's little darling bee. But there are so many other types of bees. So if we're not talking honeybee, if that's not the first thing that pops into your mind, or I say, okay, what next? A lot of times the answer is the bumblebees, then the carpenter bees, and especially the large carpenter bees. Those are the ones we're all familiar with. There's actually other carpenter bees as well. But in addition to all of those, there's a ton of other native bee species here. And we oftentimes say honeybees and native bees, and that's kind of a misnomer because it implies that honeybees are our only non-native bee, and that's not the case. There's like two dozen or so, I think, non-native species of bees in the U.S. and like 4,000 species of native bees in North America. Um, those numbers may not be exact, but they're very much in the ballparks for all of them. Plus, I mean, we're always discovering new species. So there could be other things out there too, which is always fun to find out. Um, you'll figure out pretty quickly here. I get really excited about this stuff. So yes, I'm kind of animated when I talk too. But all of these bees, and, and all of the bees that you see here, I want to say, are just a handful of the bees that I can find pretty much any time July, August in my backyard. Um, they're in pretty much everybody's yard if you take the time to look for them and look at your flowers. Many of our native bees, they may only be active for a few weeks for a particular species as adults in the entire year. So the fact that I took all of these pictures within a day or two, and pretty much most of them are on the same type of flowers, it means that there's a lot that I missed and didn't, aren't captured, I didn't take pictures of um, in my yard and in my, on my property as well. But all of these different bees, or at least most of these different bees, will use trees, and some in very different and unique ways. Got another question for you, and this is gonna kinda kind of play a little bit into how much I talk about different things for tonight. Um, but in the chat, yes or no, are you a beekeeper? I know a couple of you all, but I want to see what everybody else is. Okay. Couple beekeepers, several beekeepers, one not yet, which implies that probably, maybe, sometime in the future. So, okay, we're going to talk a lot about honeybees because, I mean, trees for bees, we could be talking about any type of bee. Like I said, there's 4,000 different native bees plus 24 or so um, non native bees here in North America and the US. So, we could talk about all kinds of things. We'll talk some about some of our native bees and how they use some of these trees. We'll talk a lot about honeybees as well. And I will say that I really targeted 
the plants that we'll talk about at the end um, towards beekeepers as well. So we'll talk a little bit about everything though with here. So I'm excited. Oh, and I am a beekeeper in case um, as well, um, in case anybody missed that. Um, beekeeper, pollinator conservationist, I do all kinds of things with it. But because like I said, I love this stuff. I'm excited about it. So if we're going to talk about trees for bees, though, we got to know how bees use trees. And when we just think about it, usually the first thing that pops to everybody's mind is flowers. They're using them for forage. And that's true. But it's not the only thing they use them for. They also use it for shelter. And some of the different ways that bees use um, trees for shelter are, we'll take the carpenter bee, that large carpenter bee. Everybody just gets so frustrated with it because it drills into porches and garages and the sides of your houses. And if you've got a wooden post for your um, mailbox into that, and they get annoying. But that's not their natural habitat. Their natural habitat are those standing dead trees and dead limbs that we cut down all the time, which are really fabulous, amazing habitat for so many animals. Um, pollinators, bee uh, pollinators, um, or carpenter bees, um, just beetles and birds. And oh, that's a whole nother presentation. Just great habitat. If you can leave a dead standing tree and it's safe to do so, do so. You'll be amazed at how much wildlife you bring in from it. But yeah, that's what their native natural habitat is and where they want to go, not into our homes, into our garages, into our porches and stuff like that. There's also other bees that will take and go into these standing dead trees and the dead branches on trees and stuff like that and find the old abandoned beetle tunnels, because many of our beetles will drill into the wood of a tree and they drill, the larva are actually chewing around little tunnels in there. And then when the larva mature and come out as a, an adult beetle, that tunnel's abandoned. Well, we've got native bee species that then go into there and use those abandoned beetle tunnels as their nesting habitat. That becomes their homes or where they lay their eggs and put their larva. So, I mean, all kinds of really cool uses for these standing dead trees. Honeybees, if there's a big cavity, semi-big, bigger than a beetle tunnel, um, decently sized big, um, hole, hollow in there, they use that oftentimes for swarms. That's where the swarm will go and that becomes their natural habitat. Natural habitat, not in a managed box. I mean, they are feral at that point because they're not native, but still, that's where they go. That's where we got the term bee gums from, was that it was those hollow trees, um, oftentimes something in the gum family that the bees would go into, and then the colonists would come, they would find that, and they would use those trees and cut those down to get harvest the honey, or take a piece of the log back and then set up their own bee gum log um, near their home site. So honeybees use them. Those are all for really direct shelter. But then you have the leaf cutter bees. And leaf cutter bees are so amazing. They're so much fun too. Because this bee, they're, most of them are kind of small. And they actually go to plants, oftentimes trees, but it doesn't have to be trees. And they cut out pieces of the leaves. It'll look like somebody took a hole punch sometimes, a giant hole punch, and just doop, 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 all around the edge of the leaves, where these leaf cutter bees have cut out a piece of the leaf and they fly back to their nesting site with this leaf. And oftentimes this piece of leaf can be almost as big and almost as heavy as the female bee herself. But they'll fly back and then they chew on it and they move it and they turn it and they make it almost a cocoon or a sleeping bag that then they then put one little ball of pollen in and they lay one little egg in and then they tuck in the sides and close it all up. And then they go get another leaf and they go do the whole thing again so that every little larva, every little egg they lay and then the larva that's going to hatch out of that has its own little sleeping bag leaf cocoon. And so yes, 
trees are extremely important for shelter. And that's something that we often overlook is their importance for that, for all kinds of bees. And of course, we have to talk about forage. And this is what we're going to really concentrate on. It's what always comes to our mind and it is extremely important. And when we're talking about trees for forage, we're actually talking about the group of trees called angiosperms. And those are the trees that produce true flowers. I know we always think flowers as being those little things that kind of grow down here at eye level uh, towards the ground. Um, those are technically, technically um, herbaceous forbs is the technical term of the flower is the reproductive unit. Um, again, we're getting into the science, but it's kind of nice to know know the terms and at least know that, yes, when we talk about flowers down here and I say it the same thing, you'll hear me say it in the presentation too. That's not really what we're talking about. But on the trees, those flowers, those flowering plants, those flowering trees are so very important because they do, they produce nectar, they produce pollen. Um, some trees, they'll get resins from it. And they'll even do this from some of the um, pine trees and cedar trees and other non-flowering trees as well. Because um, they have a lot of resins, they have a lot of things like that. They can gather and take those resins back to the hive, in the case of honeybees, and make propolis. Some of our other bees um, will use it in other ways as well. But primarily the resins, the propolis, we're thinking honeybees at that point. We're going to focus in this talk mostly on the nectar and pollen aspects of trees and that foraging because that is the direct food sources for our bees, honeybees and native bees. And as beekeepers or soon to be beekeepers, wanna be beekeepers um, according to this list, then that nectar and pollen, that's gonna be pretty important to us because the nectar becomes the honey and the pollen is baby food, really, for the young bees, or for the larvae, and then for the very, very young nurse bees will eat some of it as well. And like I said, this is all bees, not just honeybees will use the trees for nectar and pollen. So why are these trees so important? And this is an important concept to get because many people, when we're starting out on our beekeeping journey, and I was the same way, I freely admit it, we think bees use flowers, all those little herbaceous forbs that we were talking about. And we don't look up. We don't look up at the trees. We don't give the trees the credit that they deserve. But the reason why those trees are so important is because trees serve as the skyscrapers of the natural world in so many different ways. So when you think of flowers and you think of flowers, kind of using the common terminology all down here, it takes, depending on what type of flower it is and what resource you're looking at, acre, an acre to acres of little flowers spread out all across the landscape to equal the flowers on one tree. And again, that's very generalized um, there because trees produce, trees can be bigger, they can be smaller, they can have lots of flowers, they can have very few flowers. Um, talking about how many flowers are in an acre, yeah, this is it's one of those really general statistics that gets thrown around a lot. But it's a very good image to think of because think about if you're going shopping and you had to drive all over town to get everything that you need and how long that would take you versus if you could just go to a skyscraper and have all the shops right there in that skyscraper and all you had to do was go up and down the elevator and maybe a little bit here and there you'd get the job done a whole lot faster with a lot less energy involved and that's the same thing that the trees do for the bees so look at this cherry tree in this picture Look how close, you have so many blooms and blossoms right there. And the bees don't have to go far to go from here to there to the next and go to a whole lot of flowers, collect a whole lot of nectar, a whole lot of pollen, and be able to take it back. And it's going to take them a whole lot ener less energy, which means that in the case of honeybees, there's more nectar being stored, which means hopefully more honey for us to harvest as beekeepers. Um, for our native bees, 
most of them are solitary, which means that female bee, she has to find her nesting site, prepare her nesting site, and there's all kinds of different ways to prepare the nesting site, um, feed herself, lay her eggs, gather all the pollen and nectar that their, her larvae are going to need. She has to do everything herself. So for her to be able to just go to one skyscraper and get lots of the food instead of having to go everywhere, that saves her a lot of energy and helps her out too. So yes, thinking of the trees as the skyscrapers really helps, I believe, to give that image and that solidification of why they can be so important as forage plants. Now let's talk about some characteristics of what makes a good bee tree. And a lot of these characteristics are true no matter what kind of flower we're talking about. So we can talk about flowers and trees, we can talk about flower flowers, we can talk about any type of flower and these characteristics are going to be very similar among all types of flowers. But it's important to think about these because they help you understand from a bee's perspective what is going to be interesting and important for them. So first of all, we have two, well, we have lots of different ways that trees can be pollinated, but here in North America, and especially the Eastern US, there's two main ways. One is wind pollinated. And with wind pollinated plants, they produce lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of Lots of little teeny tiny pollen that blows around in the air and goes up our nose and makes us sneeze. That's what gives us our allergies. <laughs> but it's, they're producing all that pollen and it has to be so lightweight because it's just getting blown everywhere. And it's just by chance that the pollen grains are going to fall onto or get blown onto a female plant, female flower of the exact right species at the exact right time for it to pollinate that plant. So it has to have lots of pollen. These wind pollinate plants, and black walnut's the one on the um, upper left-hand picture of here. You can see the male flowers and the female flowers. Sometimes they're together, sometimes like with the black walnut, they're separate. But the male flowers are the ones that are producing all of the pollen. They don't need any sort of insect pollinator or animal pollinators, all done by the wind. But that doesn't mean our bees won't go to it. And by our means, I mean any type of bees. Because these plants have lots and lots of pollen out there, and it's just kind of hanging out there. So the bees will go to it, and they'll go, ooh, free buffet, all you can eat buffet. And they'll gather up the pollen and take it back, and they'll use it. But they're not pollinating anything. And of course, they're getting no nectar from it. Then we have insect pollinated plants. And insect pollinated plants can produce nectar and pollen like the um, apple blossom that you see in, at the lower section. And bees love these flowers because they can get the nectar and the pollen both at the same place. We also have flowers though that just produce pollen. And the shrubby St. John's wort is the yellow flower that you see on the right hand side. It looks like it should have nectar, but it doesn't. It only produces pollen, and it produces a ton of pollen. Bees love it. I mean, in July, when mine blooms, bees of all kind are all over it. We'll talk about that one a little bit later on. But yes, there's all different kinds of things that, different tricks that the plants have for getting pollinated and different rewards that they offer for that. Also, there's the shape and the color and all sorts of other things. And I'm gonna say right now, I know those are not flowers on trees, but they're so easy to use to um, show these concepts. And like I said, they apply to any type of flower. So bees tend to be more attracted to plants that are, or flowers that are yellow, blue, white, purple, something in that range. The more red it is, the less visually attracted they are to it. Um, and that's because bees don't see the red wavelengths of light. Their eyes don't pick it up. Now, that doesn't mean that it's invisible to them. With us and the way our eyes see, the way our brain processes the light inputs, things that, wavelengths of light that we can't see are invisible to us. With bees, it's not quite that simple. There's another process going on in their brains that allows them to see contrast. So, 
red against green leaves tend to look kind of grayish or blackish the best we can tell obviously we're not bees so it's hard to tell what a bee actually sees um, but from the best that we can tell that's what they're seeing plus then you get all the ultraviolet pieces in there that could be there that we don't see anyway so it gets complicated but yes as a general rule yellow blue white purple flowers are going to be most attractive to bees Flower shape is also really important. So bees love to have flowers that are open. So think about that. Um, think about rose, like wild roses, not the ornamental rose on here, but wild roses that are nice and open. Think about your apple blossoms, nice and open. Tulip poplar, nice open bowl shape there. They are goldenrod. You've got that nice landing platform that they can go on. So they like to have those sorts of shapes. They are less attracted to things like the honeysuckle because it has that long, narrow tube. And as we all know from being kids, especially if you're a kid in the Eastern US, you pop off the little end, you pull, out the, pull it out, and you drink the little teeny tiny bit of nectar at the very base of it. But think how far down that little teeny tiny drop of nectar is. So you've got on those, you've got the pollen hanging out and honeybees can collect the pollen from there, from honeysuckle. Little teeny tiny sweat bees. And we've got some little teeny tiny bees that are gnat sized bees. That's my completely technical scientific terminology for gnat sized bees. And they can crawl in there and they can drink the nectar. But for something like a honeybee or a bumblebee, bumblebees cheat. They can actually chew through the base of the flower Honeybees can't, but the bumblebees can chew through the base of the flower and drink the nectar that way. But they can't get from the front of it. That's because their proboscis or their tongue is too short. So think of it as if you went to your favorite fast food joint, got uber mega sized, um, super sized drink. They put about an inch of water or inch of soda in the bottom and gave you a straw that was about that long. And said, here you go, have fun, can't take the lid off, can't tip it. You're not going to be very happy because you can't get to it. Well, that's the way it is with the honeybees and these, or any of your bees that are bigger and they can't crawl down into these very narrow tubes or can't chew a hole in the side like and cheat like the bumblebees do. Um, and there's other, bee, other native bees that can cheat as well with that. So flower shape becomes very important. Also think about... Think about the, whether it's a wild type flower or an ornamental flower. That can also influence how much bees are attracted to a certain type of tree or any other flower. Wild type flowers tend to be more open. We as humans tend to like lots and lots of petals. So take the ornamental rose here. We have bred them so they have so many petals that it makes it really, really hard for any pollinator to get down into where the nectaries are and where that pollen is. It's just really hard for them to do it, so they don't tend to do it. We also tend to hybridize things um, to get certain characteristics, and that hybridization can make them, can make plants, depending on how the hybridization works and how closely related they are and stuff, that may make them less fertile, which means less nectar, less pollen production, because nectar, well, pollen is part of the reproductive process of the flowers, and the nectar is a re oftentimes a reward to get an animal to come in to do that pollination, especially when it's, that nectar is being produced in the flower itself. They can be produced in other places as well. We also want to talk really quickly about nectar and pollen production. Because there's all kinds of lists that you can get off the internet or anywhere else that says, plant this for bees. And it's this generic list. And I've met people who have said, oh, plant this for bees. And start giving a list without finding out anything about where you live. And those lists are so generic that how useful they are is really questionable, in my opinion. The bees will use it, but eh on how much good it's doing um, in the long run. So let's talk about some of those things that really affect nectar and pollen production. One, simple genetics. Even within the same species, different individuals are going to have different genetics. Same thing is true with people. 
my brother and I, we have the exact same parents. I'm five foot six. He's six, two, six, three ish. Um, I know, and that's just within the same family. Personally, I know people who are about four, five, four, six, and I know people who are six, 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 seven. We know the human race has even more diversity in size for full grown adults. Same things going on with plants and their nectar and pollen production. Certain individuals are going to just produce more. It's part of the genetics. Soil type can influence um, how much nectar and pollen an individual plant produces as well. Um, whether it's limestone based or sandstone based or whatever, that matters to some species more than others. How much moisture is in the soil can matter. And that can vary from one year to the next. And don't even get me started about crazy weather patterns that bring in freezes and totally mess everything up for a given year. Um, it's crazy how much variance you can have, even in one location. One of my favorite trees to use as really an example for all of this is sourwood. Because if you're in the eastern US and you're a beekeeper or a wannabe beekeeper or a honey enthusiast, just love to eat honey, you've probably heard of sourwood honey. Everybody wants to grow sourwoods. Uh, produces what many people believe is a phenomenal honey. It's okay, in my opinion. I actually like others better. Um, but it's a good honey. The plants bloom in July, August, in the summer, during the summer dearth. So lots of people love them for that. I mean, it's got so many reasons why beekeepers especially really love sourwoods. You can get sourwoods to grow in quite a few different areas. But sourwoods grow naturally in the Appalachian Mountain region. And I have talked to beekeepers in Eastern Kentucky and Eastern Tennessee who tell me, in Eastern Kentucky, they tell me you have to be above a certain elevation to actually get sourwood production, sourwood honey. And in order to have a monofloral honey, so, so like sourwood honey, it has to have 47% of the pollen in that sample has to be of whatever you're saying it is. And it has to be tested and you have to be able to back it up and show the results if somebody asks you about it. But like I said, you have to be in Eastern Kentucky, they tell me you have to be at a certain elevation or higher to get that. Eastern Tennessee, the beekeepers tell me, yes, you have to be at that higher elevation, but you also have to be on a certain side of the mountain. And that has to do with the different microclimates and the different habitat, those teeny tiny little habitats that are found in different areas of the mountains. I've read some research papers that even say that with sourwood, the microbes in the soil itself can influence nectar and pollen production. It's complicated. So one of the things I like to point out, because everybody wants to know about this stuff, is when you're looking at what plants are going to grow well in your area and comparing it to, okay, this person from Northern Ohio is telling me this and I live here in South Central Kentucky. Are we going to have the same thing or anything like that? Look at your ecoregions. Ecoregions were developed to break all of the natural resources that we have down into manageable units. So we have level one ecoregions and this is for the entire North American continent throughout all of the geopolitical boundaries and just looked at natural resource type things. You've got level one, level two, level three, and level four ecoregions. On this um, slide, I've got level three ecoregions for um, Eastern US, and you can see just how varied all the different colors represent different ecoregions. But then even within the same state, it can vary. So here's the level four ecoregions in Kentucky just to show you an example of how different and variable these areas can be. And I have a resource page that I've created just for people on this presentation. And I have the link on my last slide so you guys can go to it. And that resource page has the link to take to get you to your ecoregions. And it is so much fun. There's an interactive map that you can click on your state and it's going to take you there and you can look at your level three ecoregions. You can look at your level four ecoregions. Um, if you really dig into it, it tells you what the different regions are about. So don't get caught up whether you're on this side of the line or that side of the line. It's a gradient in there. Use it as just that general 
idea. So if you're saying, oh, I see bees on this all the time, and somebody on the other side of the state saying, what are you talking about? We've got that all over my field, and the bees never go on it. Look at your ecoregions. There's a chance that you've got different ecoregions. So this is part of the what part of the reason why some of that's going on is you might have different soils, different other things going happening there. So I've been talking for about half an hour or so now. So let me stop. Are there questions about any of these broader concepts that we've talked about? before we dive into talking about some specific trees that I like and I think are important. Well, I guess I'll just have a quick question. Is there, or if you have any guidance of where to buy trees? Because certainly you can always go to Lowe's or Home Depot or any of the big box. But we also know that if it's a tree coming across state lines, they usually saturate the soil in, in pesticides just to make sure they've killed any things. They just don't, don't want to transfer them from one area to another. So if you can maybe address also that of where to get trees. Because it's not necessarily easy to plant a tree from a seed. You can, but you might not see it in your lifetime. So. It takes a while for some of them. Yes. So one of the things I really suggest doing is going with native trees. I like the native trees the best because they're going to tend to grow really well in your area. They're native. Um, so they're going to be adapted to your crazy soils, crazy weather, um, all that good stuff. You can look at native plant nurseries. Many states have state forestry. Um, their state forestry departments have nurseries themselves. So they'll grow, and, and I mean, it's going to be a stick, but a lot of times they grow pretty quickly from there. Um, so yeah, look at some of those areas. You can order from other neighboring states. I mean, Kentucky has a state forestry nursery. That's really good. Missouri has one. Lots of different states do. Talk with your, um, if you've got a favorite nursery that you like to go to, especially if it's a little mom and pop one, um, type thing, a local nursery, talk to them. Ask them what they do. Ask them if they can special order something for you. Um, really developing that relationship and anything's important. We tell people develop the relationship with your beekeeper for your local honey. Well, develop the relationship with your nursery owners too. Hey, I'm a beekeeper and this is what I'm looking for. Can you help me? Would be my best advice. Well, and I think, uh, and then I'll you can get back to your presentation. I think too of not having unrealistic expectations of, again, a sourwood tree may not grow in Northeast Ohio, so you need to let that go. And I know when a lot of people get into beekeeping, they all think, okay, I want these specific trees because that's the kind of honey I want. Yeah, but that those trees won't grow where you are. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I actually bought it. <laughs> I bought an almond tree. I was a fool. I bought an almond tree. It's been in my yard for eight years. It hasn't gone past bush height. So, and the bees, I even took a bee from my beehive out to the flowers and went, no, we don't care. <laughs> so, yeah, no. Yeah, I tell yeah. people with sourwood that unless it grows natively in your woods, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it because it's probably not going to do it. Yeah, I'm in South Central Kentucky. And we're actually going to talk about sourwood a little bit more later, but it's listed as a major honey plant in Kentucky. Yeah, in the mountains. You can make it grow here in South Central Kentucky, but I'm in cave country. Wow. Sourwood does not like limestone soils. Well, guess what cave country has? That's kind of the definition of caves, <laughs> at least in the Eastern US. You're looking at limestone. <laughs> right. um, I know so many beekeepers have planted sourwood here in this area and then said oh i wish i'd known that <laughs> it grow i mean i know i can take you to places in western kentucky where it was planted back in the 30s and 40s and there's a few that are still growing in those areas but it's not producing sourwood honey i don't care if your hives right underneath those trees that's not going to produce sourwood honey um might do a little bit of good but yeah there's better things to plant so yeah keeping those expectations in mind if you only have one if you're the only tree there especially if it's a 
waist high bush tall almond um there's just not enough flowers <laughs> to attract it's not tall enough skyscraper <laughs> compared to everything else that's out there they're going to go to those other resources looking for that biggest bang for their buck yeah my, my two apple trees yes yes exactly <laughs> yeah. well you could go back to talk about your 12 trees and shrubs then yes and judy says that her area her park actually grows native trees, which is awesome. So yeah, start asking around, check with your native plant society. Almost every state has a state native plant society. They're gonna have a really good idea of where to get native trees in your area or native any plants in your area. So yeah, it's making those connections, networking a little bit is really the best way I think to do it. It's the best way for most things. Other questions, or do we want to jump in, jump into, dive into trees? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, and if you got more questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, and we can get to them in a little bit. But um, yeah, I'm going to talk about 12 trees and shrubs that honeybees use in the eastern U.S., and lots of other bees use too. This is nowhere near all the trees that the bees use. I had such a hard time figuring out just narrowing it down to 12. I mean, like I said, we could be here all night long just talking about trees. Um, it was hard enough narrowing it down to put it in my, to something reasonable to put in my book. Um, now I'm trying to narrow it down even further. So to do this, I wanted to have all of the seasons. So I've got three winter, early, late winter, early spring. I've got four spring trees, which, oh my gosh, that was so hard to pick which four to use there. And then I did five summer because, well, as beekeepers, we're always looking for those summer dearth plants. <laughs> and if we can get trees, bonus. So I thought, okay, I'm going to throw some bonus plants in here and kind of expand it out and just do five summer ones. I did prioritize trees that are considered honey trees or honey plants, ones that tend to be um, oftentimes lead to surplus honey. Um, depending on where you're at and time of year, your late one or early spring one's not so much, but still they're important for that fall or that early spring buildup. And I tried to choose ones that were found over the widest area possible. Now, just because it's over this entire range, maybe the whole Eastern US, like tulip poplar, pretty much everywhere in the Eastern US, doesn't mean that it's going to be used to the same extent throughout that range. It's going to vary some, but still it's going to be a pretty important plant probably in most areas. All kinds of gray area in here. Not, you don't have to be a beekeeper long. You don't have to be a naturalist long. You don't have to do anything outside long to figure out that in nature, there's very few definites. You never say never, you never say always. <laughs> there's always exceptions and always gray areas. Um, and my book does have more details about these species and many others. Um, like I said, you can only go over so much. So I'm trying to give you the, that nice grazing upper level that's still got some meat to it. So the first one that we want to talk about for that late winter, early spring are the maples. The maples are some of the first nectar producing trees that bloom. Uh, we have other trees that bloom that produce just pollen, but maples are some of our first nectar and pollen producing trees, those first insect pollinated trees. Red maple, and we have different species of maples that are native. There's also some introduced ones. The native ones are actually, in my opinion, a lot better for our bees and do a lot more for all bees than the ornamental ones. And that has to do with a lot of the genetics that's involved with them. But with our native or with, with our native maples here, red maple in my area is the first one to bloom. And then from there you get things like sugar and silver and some of the other maples in there. But these are extremely important for that early high buildup. And at least kind of in the Kentucky, Tennessee, kind of central eastern U.S. area, um, red maples are going to bloom about the time we get that February warm up. Somewhere in January, late February, more into February, um, early February, it warms up and we get two or three days of 
60 degree weather someday. Sometimes some years it'll hit 70 for one day, but usually in the 60s. And the red maples will bloom somewhere in that time frame. And like I said, that's kind of the oh my gosh, here we go. We're starting the pollinator season now with that red maple bloom, and then other things start following afterwards, including other species of maples, which are also very important. Then we have what I'm just going to group together is fruit trees. So your cherries, your apples, your crab apples, your plums, uh, pears, pe um, peaches, there's all kinds of fruit trees. Um, we have when they bloom in that time frame depends on the species, it depends on the cultivar. Uh, if you've got a small backyard orchard, you know that you can get apples that bloom at different times. And you can have early blooming apples that nine times out of 10 are going to get, the blooms are going to get frosted over and you're going to lose your fruit, but they bloom really, really early. Then you have later blooming apples that are going to produce apples later in the season that you don't have to worry about frost on. So there's this wide range in just in apples and any other fruit that we look at. We have native species, wild black cherry, choke cherries. Those are extremely important native cherries and native fruit trees for our pollinators. Um, all kinds of bees, honeybees included. There, just like I said, all of our fruit trees. And when they bloom in this late winter, early spring, maybe not so early spring, kind of into that full-blown spring time period, is going to depend again on the species, the cultivar. But the really good thing is that you can draw out that bloom time too if you're planting for them. Or if you're just looking around and seeing what's already there and then filling in the gaps, which is when I talk about planting for honeybees or any pollinators, that's one of the things I really encourage people to do. Again, this is these plants are really important for that spring buildup. And depending on your exact location, can some and time of year, and what else is blooming at the same time, can sometimes produce actually a honey harvest with them. Small, but a honey harvest. Redbud is another one that is really awesome. I have not tried redbud honey, but I've been told you probably don't want to try it twice. It's supposed to be a really dark, heavy, um, not so yummy honey, but I've never tried it myself. That's just what I've been told. But this is going to bloom in that early to mid spring period. Oh my gosh, my red buds, every species of bee out there is all over them when they start to bloom. Honeybees love them, bumblebees love them, little bitty native bees that are out love them. They're awesome. And at least in my area, when the red buds start blooming, tells me I uh, better start watching it because swarms can happen at any time. It might not be from my hives. My hives, I've got genetics that tend to build up a little bit later, but this is when I start hearing the swarm reports is when the red buds start blooming. I'm a naturalist. I pay attention to what's blooming. So everything's kind of tied to what's going on in nature for me. Moving more into that spring time period, Black locust is, oh my gosh, it is an amazing tree for all kinds of bees. It is often used, um, you all, depending on where you're at and how much black locust you have, a lot of people can get a black locust honey from it. In my area, it tends to most years coincide too much and too much overlap with the tulip poplar, so I don't get a straight black locust honey. but some people do. Um, they produce nectar, they produce pollen. So this is one that, like I said, is really, really attractive to bees of all kinds. And in a really good year, it can look like it just snowed when you look long, look at the tops of the trees because the blossoms are just so big and so white and the trees are just so full of these beautiful flowers. Tulip poplar is another one which like I said, this one's found pretty much throughout the Eastern US. Oh my gosh, I love it. Um, it's just such a pretty flower and everything loves it. The challenge with tulip poplar and pollinators is that that nice open cup shape means that if you get rains at the wrong time, it can fill up with, fill up with rain and that dilutes down the nectar. Or if it's a hot, dry spring, it can dehydrate the nectar. And 
this is getting into physiology, but it's, we'll, we'll go there just a little bit. Um, with the size of the proboscis of your bees, whether it's a honeybee or a bumblebee, carpenter bee, little bitty bees, it doesn't matter. How long it is, how, how the diameter of it, how wide it is, is going to depend, um, also help to determine how thick or concentrated of a nectar that they can suck up. So if it dehydrates down too much, it might be too thick to suck up through their proboscis. Um, think, about, think about trying to drink a milkshake, a really thick milkshake through a little bitty teeny tiny straw. I mean, you're sucking and sucking and sucking and it's really hard to get anything out of there. Um, I usually take off the lid and just start drinking at that point. But yeah, it's same sort of concept, at least, with the bees. If it dilutes out too much, then there might not be enough um, energy left in there for them to really make it worth their while to go for. Luckily, tulip poplars bloom from the top down. So there's usually several weeks worth of nectar and pollen production in there. Each individual bloom, though, will only produce nectar for the first two or three days. And then whatever's in there is in there. Hollies are another one that are really, really awesome for um, honeybees and native bees, or any bee of, for that matter. There's lots of different species. You have native ones, you have ornamental ones. I called it a spring flower, but there's some varieties, especially when you get into the ornamental, that bloom more into the summer time period as well. They produce nectar and pollen. They are extremely attractive to bees, like I was saying, but they're probably not going to compete with the tulip poplars, um, especially depending on where you're at. So if you're planting for bees, or planting for honeybees especially, take that into consideration. I mean, it's a really important plant, but it's not going to compete with the tulip poplars or something like that's, that's probably producing more nectar and pollen. Persimmons are another one that are really good. Our native species is the American persimmon. There are also exotic ones that you can buy. I really like the American persimmons. I think they taste better. Just make sure that you're, um, make sure that they're right before you try and eat the fruit. <laughs> but they're, they're yummy. They just have a lot of pucker power if you eat them, to, um, eat them when they're green. But yeah, lots of nectar, lots of pollen. They can be extremely important um, plants for honeybees as well, especially depending on your local area. Um, honeybees, they tend to forage from a three to five mile area. They can go further if they need to. They like to forage closer if they can. But generally, you're looking at about a two to three mile radius with five miles kind of being on the edge. Like I said, they can go further if they absolutely have to. It's a really good supply, but they're probably not going to. Our native bees, how far they can forage depends on the size of the bee. So bumblebee, carpenter bee, our bigger bees might be able to go a mile or so away from their nesting or foraging site, their nesting site. Little bitty bees, the gnat-sized bees, you're looking at a few hundred yards. So somebody's backyard can be a bee's entire world. So it really depends on those foraging radiuses as to how useful any of these plants are for any particular species. We like to talk about the plants, but we forget the interactions between the plants and the animals sometimes. And a lot of times we look at one or the other and know that combination changes things a lot or modifies things. So going to the summer, basswood and linden are both awesome plants. Basswood is Tilia americana, that's our native species. Linden is the exotic one, it's Tilia cordata. That's the one that's most common in the horticulture trade. I'm all about native plants, but if you can't find, I'm not a purist by any means, and this is one of those situations where if you can't find the native basswood, you can find the, but you can find the linden. Sometimes it's just called tilia. Um, fine, the bees don't care. For the most part, the bees don't care on this one. They use them pretty much equally with it from everything that I've seen and read. The catch is that they can have an infrequent nectar flow. So about every two, three years, 
is when they're going to have a really good heavy nectar flow. But they do have a lot of nectar, they do have a lot of pollen, especially during those times when they're, those years when they are having, having those heavy nectar flows. Sumac is another awesome one. Now, before everybody goes, ah, sumac! No, I'm not talking poison sumac. Poison sumac is in the toxicodendron genus. It's poison ivy genus. This is completely different. This is the rust genus. Um, sumacs, the sumacs we're talking about are, they don't have any allergic reaction to them at all. Unless you've got some odd weird, I mean, everybody can be really allergic to anything um, if you've got some unique allergy. So you'd have to have some unique allergy to be allergic to these sumacs. But there's lots of different species. Uh, smooth winged staghorn are some of our most common native ones. There's a few, um, few that are exotic that you can sometimes get. Mostly they bloom during the summer. There's one species um, that I'm familiar with in the Eastern US, fragrant sumac, that blooms like in March. So it's a very early bloomer, but for the most part, the ones that most of us are going to be more familiar with, those are summer bloomers. And the awesome thing is, is that smooth winged and staghorn, at least where I'm at, they kind of one, then the other, then the other. So you've got this progression, if you get all three of them, of the blooms. And yes, all kinds of bees and other pollinators love these things. They're blooming during the summer dearth, um, especially if you got one of these, uh, one of these that I'm talking about here. You've got nectar, you've got pollen coming in. Yeah, they're awesome. They do form clonals, um, colonies sometimes, especially depending on the species. So they can be a little aggressive in your area, depending on where you're planting them. But yeah, they can be a great one. And I've even heard of people getting sumac honey harvest. If they're doing very small harvest batches, being able to get some of this. By that point, uh, my bees are in the summer dearth. I'm not harvesting honey off of them. Sourwood, we have to talk sourwood, I, I'm sorry. We have to talk about it because it is in the right locations, such a great plant for bees of all kinds. But like we were talking about, it's very picky about its location. You can't grow it everywhere. So don't even try, don't waste your money, pick a better plant. Um, and even in the best, most ideal locations, you only really get a good nectar flow for about three out of every five years. So it does a really good nectar flow and then it takes a year off where it's kind of, and we'll do a little bit, but we're not going to put a whole lot of energy into reproduction. I mean, it's a tree. It can do that. And then a whole lot of nectar flow and then it might take a little bit. So it's not the end all be all. There is no end all be all magic plant, not even among the trees. Another one of my favorites is buttonbush. And oh my gosh, buttonbush, everything loves it. Every bee species, every butterfly species. It's the host plant for some of our big sphinx moths. Hummingbirds love it. Um, it likes to grow in, in, wild, in the wild areas in nature. It's going to be growing like along the creek beds and the banks and the lakes and the streams and stuff. Um, so then the waterfowl come in and they eat the seeds and it's amazing. Now, most of us probably don't have creek beds, swamps, banks, or um, ponds, lakes, stuff like that in our yards. If we do, awesome. In a cultivated situation where you can water it during the summer droughts, it grows just fine in medium soil. I know people who have put it next to the rain spout. And oh my gosh, I have never seen button bushes as big as their button bushes, um, especially when they go out there and they water a little bit more during the summer droughts. But yes, it is an amazing plant that blooms during the summer dearth. I mean, July and August in Kentucky. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Another one that I really like is Devil's Walking Stick, also sometimes called Hercules Club. This is one you'll see growing kind of along the woods edges is where I find it a lot of times. And it has these big, long, huge, pinnately compound, tropical looking leaves. And they're absolutely awesome and amazing. And then it puts up these big plumes, like you can see here, of gorgeous little white flowers. I mean, it's just 
an amazing looking plant that is so attractive to every single type of hymenoptera out there. And they, I mean, bees love it. Um, your little bitty wasps not lo love it. Don't worry, nothing's gonna come after you type thing with this. I mean, it's amazing. And then in the, um, the fall, when you get the berries, the birds come and they devour all the berries. So it's an awesome tree for so many ways. Don't plant this next to the kids' swing set. Don't plant this next to the major walkways because it gets its name Devil's Walking Stick or Hercules Club. Um, very honestly, all along the trunk and rings. It is perfect rings almost. Going around the trunk are thorns. And a lot of times you'll see, I mean, they can get to be tree-sized trees, but a lot of times when you find them growing, or at least when I find them growing out in the wild, they're walking stick size, perfect walking stick size, not the walking stick you want to grab, especially not if you're sliding down a bank and you're trying to grab a tree to stop you. No, you really don't want to grab the Hercules um, club or the devil's walking stick. But it is an, um, oh, and even the leaves can have thorns. But we're in the right place. It's an absolutely amazing plant. And like I said, the bees love it. So put it off in the back part of the property. Uh, if you've got, I know people that have cleared out their woods and cleared it all out because it was that sticky tree. I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. You want this tree. For bees, you want this tree. I've had old timers tell me before everybody started cleaning all the fence rows out so well, where there was a lot, when there was lots of this, that where you've got a good grove in the middle of July, it'll sound like there's a swarm up there and it's just the bees working so hard. So it really does produce a lot of nectar and it's a really awesome plant. So with that, I'm going to say again, thank you guys so much for spending some time with me this evening. I will ask any question, answer. I, I can ask you questions, but I will answer any questions you want to ask. <laughs> and yeah, here's my contact information. I do host a blog and a podcast all about different things that you can find outside in your backyard. Um, I do have the nursery. You can go to my website and stuff, but go to this resource page and it's got all this information in there plus so much more. It's got links to all kinds of different things there that you can look at. And of course, you can always contact me to um, ask more questions if you think of something later. But yeah, and again, all of this information, well, not all this information, but all the plants that we talked about and so many more and much more information about those plants is in my book if that's something that you're interested in as well. But yeah, uh, question time. <laughs> Well, thank you. I know we are up to uh, kind of the hour and um, Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's it's all right. It's an interesting subject and it's uh, I'll just kind of make one comment. Maybe there's a question in it about um, almonds in that the research I've read is that the native bees actually go to the tops of the trees and the honeybees don't want to go up that high. But if you have and it really makes sense, you know, we're trying to plant in the almond fields flowers so the bees have something else to eat. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think, as you, as you pointed out, having the grocery store all in one place. Instead of the bees going to almonds and then going, you know what, I'm tired of almonds, I'm going to go over to the alfalfa field. So they're spending that energy going so far away so that if we did plant more of these things instead of the scalp soil and almonds, because I realize it's all about the inputs they put in the soil. But as you were saying, really, it's an acre of flowers, loosely based, an acre of flowers equals one tree. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have that, that diversity. It's just about when things bloom so that you've got something grow across the growing season, but you've got to have that diversity. The trees, some trees for propolis and some for the flowers and some for the pollen and then some for the nectar. And, and then you have the flowers for other diversity. So it really makes a lot of sense to put in the trees for bees as well. Yeah. And not all nectar is the same and not all pollen's the same. I mean, it's just like, I mean, this is something I get into more with some of my other talks, but um, it's just like us. Blueberries are really, really good for you because they're so full of antioxidants. But none of us would live very long if all we ate were blueberries. We'd have all kinds of issues with that. We need that varied, diverse diet because different plant, different things that we eat have different amino acids and different vitamins and different minerals. And it's the same thing with the nectars and the pollens. And um, nectar has different, depending on what species it's coming from, it's going to have different sugars in it. There's all kinds of vitamins and minerals and other mac micronutrients that we've kind of ignored that we're finding out are pretty important. 
uh, much more important than we thought in the nectar. I mean, the pollen's made up of different amino acids and again, different other things. Oh my gosh, it just gets so complicated when you get into bee nutrition. And the best thing to do to make it simple is just plant as much as you can and have it as diverse as possible and make sure you've got some different things blooming, not just something, but different things blooming throughout the entire growing season. Right. Well, and, and as we said before, uh, plant what's native really to your area. Almonds, not native to Ohio, don't plant an almond tree in Ohio. It's just, it's just now my joke in my front yard going, look, it's blooming again, but it's still like one stalk and nothing goes to it. So, so again, set those expectations rationally and plant what is native and learn to love what is native. And I think that's some of what the nursery industry has not done well by people. We have to learn to love what's native. So thank you very much, uh, Shannon. Certainly, I want to thank everyone again for attending tonight. Our final webinar in this Creating Pollinator Habitat series is just before National Pollinator Week, June 16th. We will have Anne Aquilo, uh, who will share the public-private partnership to develop pollinator habitat along a highway. They're going to talk about their specific project they did 